In our last video, we built this Amiga 500 Plus clone. This is a Remix 500 board, it's an open hardware remake of the Amiga 500 board, and we had a lot of fun building it. We used almost all new parts, with the exception of the chips and the connectors, which can't be bought new these days. It almost worked perfectly first time, in fact I would say it is working, but we have an unfortunate graphical glitch. So we have our first Amiga repair video. Let's get down to it. It was pretty heartbreaking to plug this thing in after spending quite a lot of hours soldering all these joints, only to see this garbled screen. At least we can recognise the Amiga Kickstart ROM. That's something. The garbling is quite interesting, so it seems to be smearing the pixels across the screen, even overlapping onto the next scanline. Now this is the first time I've worked on an Amiga, so I'm going to try and explain the steps in my logic of trying to figure out what's going wrong here without saying anything that isn't true. That's going to be pretty tricky, so feel free to correct me along the way. My understanding is that this graphical data must be stored in memory somewhere, and it's fetched out and delivered to the video circuit, where the RGB signals are generated, quite simply. Now somewhere along the way, that graphical data is being smeared out um, ahead of the scanline, and even onto the next scanlines, as you can see here, if I pause it at the right moment. It's a little bit interesting that we could, it looks like we could almost reconstruct the image if we dragged all of these scanlines back over. I don't know if that's necessarily true and I can't be bothered messing around in paint trying to do it, but it seems like the graphical data is there and it's intact, maybe. It's just being somehow fetched incorrectly. There is a diagnostic ROM which we're going to run in this video, but I need to order a suitable ROM chip, an EEPROM, and I need to order an adapter for my programmer so that I can program this massive ROM chip. So in the meantime, let's do a bit of head scratching. This Amiga PCB reproduction was manufactured by PCBWay. Check out the project page in the description if you want to order your own. Doing so supports the creator, who will get 10%. And the four spare PCBs that PCB were made were given away to you in our live giveaway. Here's something that you should do. Why not check out the project pages on PCBWay and have a look at some of the weird and wonderful things that all the creators have been putting together. I love browsing through here and getting inspiration for my own projects. Most of my projects are daft and lots of the things on here are also daft. Thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring another video. The Amiga doesn't just have an RGB out, it also has this composite video out. We're very familiar with composite video on this channel because that's what we modify all our ZX Spectrums to do. So instead of using this RGB, we're going to try the composite video connector. Now, Denise is here generating RGB digital values and those are being converted by the video hybrid chip here to analog values. The video hybrid also generates a composite signal, although it is black and white, there's no colour information encoded into it, so it's just the Luma signal and the synchronisation pulses. Let's have a little look at the schematic around the Denise chip. So here's the or part of the video circuit, and up in the top left here we have Denise, which is one of the custom chips which was donated from the other A500 Plus board. Denise uh, receives a 16-bit data bus and some addressing uh, register address uh, values on the uh, inputs on the left, as well as some clocks and sinks and timing things in the bottom left. We have R, G and B coming out to the right in the form of 4-bit values, well, uh, 4 bits for each, each colour, R, G and B. And I think this is something to do with bit planes, I guess I'll learn more about that later. These 4-bit RGB digital values are somehow timed or clocked or buffered through these 74LS245 chips where they go into the video hybrid. That's that funny chip that looks like a big fat resistor pack. Now this generates analog RGB values as well as a composite video signal which we can see here on pin number 19. These go off to the right where we have our composite video connector CN10, which we've just looked at, as well as CN9, which is our 23-pin video connector. That's where the RGB signals go to. Let's have a look at the video signal produced by the video hybrid on composite. So here we go, this is what we were seeing. As expected, the composite signal, which is on the upper left screen, is black and white, and it seems to be showing the exact same glitch as the RGB video signal. 
Now my understanding is that the video hybrid is quite dumb and it's simply converting digital signals to analog and generating the composite signal. So I'm going to assume that the data it's being fed is represented by the image we're seeing here and it's doing its job correctly. All right, so what is feeding the video hybrid? Well, the next chips in the chain are these two 74LS245 chips. These are brand new and I did try swapping them and the glitch remained the same. So based on that quick test, I'm going to assume they're fine. So what about Denise? Denise receives 16 bits of data and it also receives eight bits of some kind of address data. Down here, it's receiving some clocks and a signal called C-Sync, which is something to do with synchronization pulses. I don't know if it's a combination of H-Sync and V-Sync, but it seems important. Looking at the glitch, it would be easy to think that this has something to do with synchronization issues, and I suppose it could, although I would expect a machine with synchronization issues to have a much more unstable display than this. Saying that, I'm not an Amiga expert, so what do you think? At this point, I have a hunch that Denise isn't the issue, but I'm not certain, and I did buy a spare Denise chip, but that's still on its way at this point in the process, so let's continue scratching our heads. Where does all this information come from to get to Denise? Well, I've learned that the fat Agnes chip is responsible for fetching information from memory and serving it up to Denise to generate its RGB signals. If we take a look at fat Agnes on the schematic, it's here in the CPU and Agnes page. Here it is in the bottom right. And we can see all of the sync signals, H-sync, V-sync, C-sync being generated down here. The arrows seem to be two way, so I'm not quite sure what that means. And up here, we can see the RGA address um, values coming out of Agnes as well. So yeah, Agnes is responsible for generating the, or fetching the data and generating the sync pulses, which are then used by Denise and the video circuit to generate our video signals. What is very unfortunate is that a new fat Agnes chip at the time I'm making this video will cost you at least £130 for a tested one. So, ouch, that really sucks. It would be great to be able to confirm that the fat Agnes is the problem before investing that kind of money, because I've got no spares. This is the first Amiga I've ever built. So it's time to break out the diagnostic ROM. While we've been scratching our heads, all these bits have arrived. This is an adapter. There's a couple of these out there. They seem to have a similar design and it's to allow you to program larger ROM chips with your XGeku Pro, your TL866 uh, chip programmer thingamabob. This adapter is specifically made for 27C160, 322, 400 or 800 EEPROMs. Now do read the instructions. Depending on the EEPROM you're using, you need to configure these four switches. So be mindful of that. This adapter plugs into the XGeku, that's the one I've got here. This is a TL8662 Plus, I think. Yeah, that's it. And it doesn't have enough pins for the 27C400 EEPROM, which we're going to be using. So we plug in this adapter. And to get the orientation right, I just copied the pictures off the eBay listing, which shows you how to use this adapter thingy. Now for the EEPROM, it's a 27C400. It's the biggest EEPROM I've ever used. Here it is, this is a blank one. Um, I'm gonna have to get a EEPROM eraser because I've got so many of them now with random images on. Um, I guess they're pretty cheap and cheerful, aren't they? Anyway, the EEPROM goes in here and then the adapter goes into the XGeku, no problem. There are a few more care points in the process, so let's carefully flash this chip. Booting up the software, I choose my kind of programmer, which is a TL8662+. Then we have to select a specific type of chip. So let's go select IC. And what we're looking for is uh, AMD, hold on, 27C4096, DIP40. We need to choose that one, even though that's not the chip we're programming. It's just because we're using an adapter. We then make sure to uncheck the check ID box because otherwise it would throw up an error because the chip isn't the chip that it thinks it is. The instructions then say to set the pulse delay down to 50 microseconds, so we'll do that. Now we need to load the ROM file that we want to flash, so if we click on load and then we can click browse and find the ROM image. 
It's just one image we need to flash, which is a 16-bit binary file from the Amiga Diagnostic ROM website. Go and check it out, link in the description. Didn't need to change any of these settings, I can just click OK and then start the flash. So it doesn't start flashing immediately when you click OK, you need to go up here and click Program and then click Program again. And I'm going to fast forward now because this took quite a while. Success! Hooray! I almost resisted putting the EEPROM under the microscope, but I did get these shots when it arrived, and out of curiosity I decided, let's have a little look at it. So I'm just going to show you some shots around the EEPROM. The big uniform shiny coppery looking bits must be the actual memory of the EEPROM. This seems to be some sort of control for the various rows and columns in there. Around the outside, I'm not even going to try and guess, but isn't it pretty? Almost like looking at another world. I'd love for a super powerful telescope to take a picture of another planet and see something like this. Anyway, I digress. Let's get the EEPROM fitted. So I've removed the original ROM from this socket and I'm going to pop this one in. And as with the original ROM, we're putting it as far down the socket as we can, as indicated by the arrows on the silk screen. Now we can boot it up and see what the diagram gives us. So flashing colors warning, here we go, I think it runs a memory test first, but I'm not totally sure. I'm just hoping it makes it through to some kind of menu. So, it's doing stuff, that's good, we want it to do stuff. Let's see if it comes up with anything readable. Aha, there we go, Amiga Diagram V1.3 by John. Oh, by the way, go and support these guys, check out the link in the description. I've just paused it there so we can have a little look at what it says on here. So it has done some memory tests, it's done a ROM checksum test, which is good. Uh, everything is green. And um, the text in pink, I think, is quite important. It says if this ROM is sold and you sell for more than uh, 10 euros plus hardware cost, 25% must be donated to a legitimate charity of some kind. I think that's a brilliant message to put on there. And it does have a link there to the website and the GitHub repo. Okay, let's move on to the menu. So in the next place we get to is the menu. And it's going to give us lots of options. I'm just pausing it again. And I'm going to go straight into the graphic tests for this video. I did run other ones, but the graphic test is the one that gave the interesting result. Everything else passed. And our issue is definitely, or seems to be definitely, some kind of graphics issue, assuming the memory is all okay. So I'm going to hit 4 and enter the graphic test menu. And first thing we're going to do is the test picture. And I've got a feeling it's going to be okay. So I'll hit 1. And here is our test picture, our little test card thing. And that looks good to me, so I guess no problems there. Let's move on to the next interesting test. And this is going to be the scroll test on uh, option number three. Now, I've heard of a thing called a blitter which lives within Fat Agnes, and I heard about it in one of the Amiga movies, which are fantastic, by the way. I say movies, it's more like a documentary. Anyway, the blitter, as far as I understand it, can move vast amounts of memory very quickly in big blocks and that enables games on the Amiga to have a very smooth scrolling action. At least that's what I picked up from the Amiga documentary. So I've got a feeling that this is going to test the blitter. Let's try it out. Hitting number three we get a test card and total garbage. Absolute destruction. I've got a feeling we have a problem with the blitter. Assuming that this test exercises the blitter, and you can look into the docu documentation and see exactly what it is doing, but this is basically giving me a very strong indication that the problem we have is indeed with the Fat Agnes chip, which is pretty much the worst possible result. And how frustrating that everything else on this computer seems to be working fine so far, at least, but this test is failing miserably. I'm going to have a little look around some of the other tests anyway, out of interest, just sort of pressing buttons and seeing what kind of images come up. And I think everything looks good to me. It just seems to be the scrolling. The animation is broken. And that explains, I guess, what we're seeing on the ROM boot screen. So, in order to totally confirm if it is the blitter, which is the problem, I need to get a new Fat Agnes chip, which means opening up the wallet and splashing out over £100 on a replacement. So let's do that. Hooray! 
And spoiler alert, did you notice it? I already had the new Fat Agnes in in the earlier shots, which I took after for the purposes of the video. So this is the new Fat Agnes chip, which I got from eBay. They're sold as tested, and we're gonna try it out straight away with the diagnostic ROM and see how we get on with the scroll test. So I fitted it, and I'm about to run the test. Cross your fingers, please. Here we go, we're hoping to see something scrolling across the screen. Ah. Well, it's not going crazy. It, it's only the middle band which is scrolling across. I'm going to assume that's correct, and that's what the ROM's designed to do. Uh, I should probably check that. Anyway, I'm too excited now, so let's rip out the diagnostic ROM and plug in the kickstart ROM and see what happens. Hey, it's working. That's miles better, isn't it? Okay, I think we've got a working Amiga finally. It almost worked first time, I just got unlucky and got a bad fat Agnes chip, which has bolted on another hundred odd quid to the cost of this thing, but I'm pleased that we got there in the end. So where does that leave us with our bill? Well, for the extra fat Agnes chip, you can stick on another £130, which puts our total to a whopping £636 so far. But do keep in mind that you've got four spare PCBs, so you could have split that between your friends. You could try and buy one on its own for cheaper, or you could sell the spare four PCBs. You also don't need to spend £250 on new parts. You could take most of them from the donor board, and I got unlucky with the Fat Agnes chip. So you do stand to save potentially three to four hundred pounds on this bill so far. I've just been a bit daft and done it this way. So where does that leave us? We have a working Amiga 500 Plus board that we finally debugged, got a new Fat Agnes chip in there, and we're ready to start putting it into a case. Join me in the next video where I'll talk around what I'm going to do with the keyboard, here's one I got earlier, the case, the power supply, and how I'm going to load games and use a mouse with it. So stick around for the next one. See you then. Bye bye.